Time for the Roots and Roots Show with your host, Greg Rashid. Bringing you history and music from the Black American diaspora. The goal of this show is to empower you with information that you can then seed and grow within your community. Now, here's your host, Greg Rashid. Well, I want to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the universe. This is Greg Rashid with another edition of the Root and Root Show. Heard at your convenience on the many platforms, but a lot of folks listen every Sunday afternoon, 3 p.m. Mountain Time in Colorado on KUHS Denver.com, created by the one and only, the legendary, there's only one, Henry Archer Letter. And I want to say hi to all my friends in the Colorado region. I hope I get back there next year at some point. I, I, want, I haven't been there in three years. I really want to get back there, but we'll see. But right now, I'm in lovely Bangkok. And if you're here in the background, they're selling fruit. There's a truck that's going fast selling fruit and other products, vegetables, um, a little bit of everything. And so that, this is something, and I've told my friends this, that um, there was a time in America where you would have trucks coming in your neighborhood selling vegetables, selling fruit. And I'm talking about when I was a kid, when I was in the late 50s and early 60s and in the 70s. But now in America, I don't think they do that. And this is a little town, farm area or something. But here in Bangkok, and this is the major center, it's the capital of Bangkok. You hear it. These trucks come past selling their food, fruit and vegetables. And, and that stuff on it from these farmers is amazing. It's great stuff. Organic. Other than they don't say it's so organic, but it's really organic. It's just so wonderful. And I might, you know, I might just leave my uh, post here as far as running this show and just go get something in a minute. But no, I'll, I'll stay here. I'll stay here because we have a great show today. And speaking of Asia, because I'm in Asia in Bangkok, and um, I did a show um, last month with the great uh, poet E. Ethelbert Miller. And as you know, I'm working on trying to interview folks live, but right now I'm doing it by asking questions and sending the questions by email and they're responding. And the person who asked the questions to Ethelbert was Sherry Mazet, and she's a Hollywood casting director and good friend of Ethelbert. And I thought after I heard the interview and hearing her and looking up her bio, I realized that she would be great on this show as far as interviewing her about her experience with being an Asian in Hollywood and what she's gone through, in particular now or what's going on in America with the whole thing of Asian racism, the increase of that and all that. I thought it'd be good to get her perspective with other folks that she knows Asians in Hollywood. So I'm going to run that interview right now. It's about 37 minutes long. Hope you enjoy it. I really enjoyed hearing from Sherry, but we'll get to this right now. Hope you enjoy this interview as we start up right now on the Root and Root Show. And I'm your host, Greg Rashid. All right. So my name is Sheree Mezik, and I am a casting director based in LA. And I have invited three filmmakers uh, to join me today to talk about lots of cool topics, uh, specifically around Asians and Asians in Hollywood. So my first person I've invited is the wonderful filmmaker Tu Quinn. And she is going to introduce herself um, and tell you more about herself as a filmmaker. Hi, and thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. Um, I am still a fledgling filmmaker. I'm primarily right now a magazine writer. And uh, in the past, I've been an academic. So, you know, it takes all kinds of steps to arrive at the stories you want to tell on different kinds of screens. Uh, right now, I'm writing mostly travel and quote unquote living and culture articles for places like Vogue magazine, Esquire, The Daily Beast, uh, PBS and uh, various other outlets. And I've been also focusing on Asian American women's issues and even uh, specifically Vietnamese American women's issues. And right now I'm writing a couple of things for Vietcetera. Um, would you mind just uh, saying your name and like where people can find you? Cause I love for them to be able to hear that. Of course. Um, in, uh, 
America commonly referred to as Taupe Dawn Nguyen, but uh, in Vietnamese it'd be Taupe Dawn Nguyen with uh, some diacritics on there. And my website is consideratecontent.com. All one word, C-O-N-S-I-D-E-R-A-T-E, C-O-N-T-E-N-T.com. Perfect. And, and, that, and sorry. Oh, and you can find all my uh, social media and uh, all my work housed there. Perfect. All right, so let's jump in. So um, I guess our first question is, uh, who were your role models uh, growing up in Hollywood? Oh, my goodness. You got me already. Um, <laughs> I hate to say it, I didn't really grow up with uh, too many Asian diaspora, Asian American role models. And I was taught uh, writing and screenwriting by primarily white men. So I do acknowledge uh, knowing that fact and that uh, perhaps influence um, has shown itself in some of my styles, although I did try to uh, branch out and be more well-rounded in my media studies as just an average American viewer so you know I watched people like Greg Araki because I knew he, <laughs> he's Asian American and um, a little left of center and not completely mainstream um, then I found out about uh, Karen Kusama mm-hmm. who's a Japanese American and then I fi- found out about uh, Lisa Joy who is a uh, Asian American and uh, you know since then I have paid a lot more attention to people who make films who look a little more like me uh, or like Andrew on watched his stuff. But growing up, I didn't feel like I had access to that because I didn't grow up with the internet. Um, <laughs> so everything I had to find, I had to find through print or at the library. <laughs> so it's a little, a little tougher, but um, as I've gotten older over the decades, I've uh, found better influences, I think that uh, bring a little, truer to me but growing up it was very difficult so my influences were sadly um you know Tarantino back then was a revolutionary when I was growing up um (laughs) well you know we'll talk about that separately another day but those were the more you know standout filmmakers that you know kick people in the face um and, and I mean random stuff like Merchant Ivory too those films were prevalent when I was growing up and showed a whole different uh, thing you know period pieces so I have leaned towards period pieces because that was what I had access to mm. great um, yeah access is everything oh. <laughs> all right so um I would love to learn more about how and when you decided to become a filmmaker no I didn't even really decide and it was a uh, jazz for my dog is, is going to answer for me um <laughs> I, I've always known that I, I uh, was a writer because I started writing um, since I was very young. I wrote small books and Jasper's my witness. I, I wrote uh, small books and I knew I was a writer, but as for film, and I really thought that was a make-believe world, not one that I wanted to be part of film and TV. Uh, I grew up on the East Coast and I saw it and it never really appealed to me. But um, after 9-11, I thought I would spend a few months on the West Coast just to get away from depressing things and and try to regroup so I came to Los Angeles and thought I would just get back to my trajectory of going to be in a corner office and work in advertising and marketing which was my my thing after graduation and a few other tries at things um but then I started working in Los Angeles at a nightclub and I met uh young men who worked in Hollywood. (laughs) So I kind of got roped into learning on the job. So I was very fortunate that I had people who wanted me around and were comfortable with me learning the ropes Mm -hmm. and and knew that I had an interest in storytelling. But still, I didn't think it would be my thing. And uh, I guess I decided along the way that I was comfortable with the format of writing about 90 pages at a time. Mm -hmm. And then again, more years went by and I thought, no, I really feel like I want to be part of changing storytelling because I wasn't seeing what I needed to see and uh, mm-hmm. also fell into groups of people who felt the same way, like our visual rhetoric mm-hmm. visual rhetoric could be better, not just for entertainment, but for society. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. 
Uh, so we're going to jump into a more uh, visible topic, I think, that a lot of people have been talking about, and that's the obvious rise in the ways in which uh, Asians have been attacked over the course, I mean, beyond and before this pandemic, but specifically, I think, the awareness around it. Um, so I, I was wondering what your lens into that topic is. Yeah, I'm, I'm super glad that it's, it's more visible, but I think as a community, we also have to examine how we treat each other and how people uh, feel about us um, mm -hmm. as stereotypes of being you know, submissive or overly compliant or quote unquote hard workers and how people view us and how we can change that and how we treat each other as a community. There's self-hatred, there's inter-community erasure. And there's also a lot of negatives going there or using the community as you know, a branding tool. And so I think we really need to examine those things in a 360 to look at all kinds of Asian hate and why we may be treated that way and why we may treat our own certain ways too and eliminate certain things within first and also then take a huger look <laughs> at how we can continue to change things and how people view us and we view ourselves and each other or unfortunately stay with the status quo and have this veneer that may, might not help any of us. Absolutely. So uh, to swing it back to some positive, there have been so many wonderful accomplishments um, in Hollywood uh, that has helped contribute to the what many are seeing as a rise in visibility about around uh, Asian filmmakers. So I know you've written about this. I don't know if you want that to be your way in, but I'd love to hear how you see the significance of this rise um, playing a part and what part that plays in your opinion. Yes, I think that you're, you're right on with that. I'm so glad that in particular Asian diaspora women behind the camera have gotten a lot more attention um, namely with Chloe Zhao, like, mm -hmm. of course, her style is, is beautiful, and anyone can see that across any kind of medium or storytelling, no matter what the subject matter is, because we've had, of course, men of color getting a lot of attention first, and that seems to be, you know, the way it goes, is that our mm -hmm. Asian, Asian diaspora men are seen in filmmaking, and then the women secondary, but I feel like uh, as, you know, <laughs> we get more and more into the now uh, Asian diaspora women are showing what we're made of and there's always room for more and I, I'm super fortunate that I have been able to um, you know strike up friendships with people uh, like Marion Hill, uh, Marion Huang Ngoc Hill so she is uh, Vietnamese American. Um, her mom is Vietnamese and her dad is actually British but she grew up here in the U.S. and abroad so we get to commiserate on things and you know, recently I worked on a, a project where um, there's another uh, Vietnamese, Vietnamese American uh, young woman named uh, Patty Harrison. Mm -hmm. She is in front of the camera, but she also did some writing behind the camera, um, and I did too uh, for Paramount. So the, the credits didn't fall, you know, for for us to have specific credit, but it is some additional literary material that we did, and we're both Vietnamese American working on this project so there's always room to be together to work on things and further our culture together and not think that there can only be one mm -hmm. yeah. absolutely and then lastly yeah. I'd love to hear your advice that you might have for other young Asian um Amer Asian and Asian American uh aspiring filmmakers and how to break into Hollywood or really just any advice you might have for them yeah, I think you have to be incredibly patient and tenacious. And for me personally, I, I say that anytime anyone asks me this question, um, I spoke to my friend Lindsay's um, film class the other day. She went to AFI and, and teaches a class at night at a studio. And I, I told these teenagers, actually, or anyone of any age, I think it's really important to have manners and to not try to exclude people because it is a very small town. And a lot of people know a lot of other people and you know, it's it's just a better look for all of us <laughs> as Asian diaspora to be just simply kinder to each, to each other. And I don't believe in proprietary things or, you know, competition unless it's helpful to you to propel things forward. But yeah, just to have good manners and share. And I know everyone says to have those relationships, but 
it's not that easy. Um, I mean, it's not that hard <laughs> to uh, just be nice and ask how people are uh, genuinely without wanting something from them. Just don't be stereotypical 